Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mid-Century Modernism with Monique. I'm Monique Anton, your host, and I have today on the show my friend Danny Heller. How are you, Danny? Hi, Monique. How are you? Very good. I'm happy that you're here. Well, thank you for I, having me. I appreciate it. This is so fun. I'm glad we could do this over Zoom, and thankfully, Zoom is allowing us to talk to Danny, who is all the way down in um, in Southern California. Yeah, so, Dan crossed, it, it you know makes it through the whole interview just fine. <laughs> <laughs> I will. So, Danny is an artist and an amazing painter that has been exhibited all over the world, from Paris to Madrid to LA. And he's been featured in magazines like Dwell, California Home and Design, Architectural Digest, hello, Architectural Digest Spain, and Atomic Ranch, and a Cos Cosmopolitan Magazine and others. And I want to start by asking you how you got into mid-century modern architecture and this love of yours. How did that start? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of been a long process. So, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of Los Angeles. So I was always around kind of uh, that post-war tract housing. Um, it wasn't particularly high-end, like modernism, um, but it did have that kind of, you know, mid-century 1950s kind of classic tract housing vibe that you'd probably find in most suburbs around the U.S. Uh, I didn't think much of it, but... Um, you know, I did take a class in mid-century architecture in college. And then I think when I when I returned to the Valley, I kind of, I started picking up on this kind of vibe. And then it, it also sort of um, was in conjunction with modernism hitting mainstream television. You know, you had Mad Men and things like that. Movies like, I don't know, Catch Me If You Can. And so I, I think... The, the aesthetic started to kind of sink in and I was more aware of it. And uh, my my first foray into modernism were Eichler's. It was uh, the Balboa Highlands track uh, outside of L.A. And I actually grew up like, I don't know, just minutes from it. And so, um, you know, I made it a point to, to drive through the area and, and then I was hooked. I love it. I love it that it started with Eichler's. You know, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say that Eichler's, because they were the most math produced home uh -huh. of this style, usually was the gateway for people oh. to get into modernism. So. Totally my gateway drug to modernism. <laughs> yes. So we are starting here with a screen. Danny has is going to show us this beautiful art. For those of you listening on all of these podcasts, please go to my YouTube uh, under my name, Monique Anton, to view all of his amazing paintings. So we're starting here, how appropriate, with this Eichler. So if you could share with us a little bit about this painting, so gorgeous. And by the way, everyone, you can purchase any of these on his website at dannyhellerart.com. But this one is so beautiful and vibrant. Um, how did this come about? Yeah, uh, so I think what, what kind of drew me to the Eichlers and modernism in general is just how sort of stripped down and clean it was. Um, you know, it wasn't like super fussy with weird, ornate decorations. Now, I mean, in the neighborhood, some of them had been bastardized, you know, with, with big, uh, you know, Roman columns and things like that. Mm. Um, but, you know, the good ones, the pure ones, the original ones, the, the original aesthetic is just sort of that clean geometric uh kind of design and it's very strong and it's it's very engaging and um and so i i wanted to to kind of capture that i wanted to study how the light hits every single angle again all that geometry and sort of you know what that can do um uh, visually it, it almost uh turns into sort of a geometric abstract kind of image with just shapes and blocks of color so, you know, with this uh, painting that you see on the screen, you know, that that pop of that kind of orangey red door versus uh, kind of a mint green surrounding. Um, so the, the color combinations pop, the geometry pops, and then it's sort of all set within this, you know, very kind of tranquil suburban setting. I so. love it. And it looks like a photograph, to be honest, a lot of your work 
doesn't even look like a painting. It looks so real and vibrant. And I think you're, we discussed this before, but I think that even for people that don't understand modernism and it's not maybe their aesthetic, they are firsthand getting this lifestyle. You're, you're translating this beautiful architecture to them. And I think they see this happy, beautiful, wonderful architecture. So Thank yeah, you for making that so you know crossing borders of different genres to people. So thank you. I you know I I appreciate that. Um, yeah, because I I do portray these these beautiful homes as realistically as possible to to show that they are in fact real homes, things that really do exist. And I've had a, a number of people come up to me saying that they either grew up around this or they currently live around this kind of architecture. And they wouldn't normally think twice about it, but the way I've sort of isolated it and captured it, it sort of makes them more aware of it and thus appreciate it more. So, you know, I, I feel like my job is done when they, uh, when they <laughs> tell me that they appreciate it. So. Yeah, mission accomplished on that one. Yeah, I so love, the, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, oh, good. Look at that. So here's another one. So, so the last image is, is the kind of token flat roof Eichler. This one has a bit of that gable to it. Um, and of course, you know, classic car just kind of poking out of the, the carport there, which you'll see in a lot of um, a lot of the Eichlers, you know, it sort of completes the whole set. So, yes. uh, but, you know, again, you know, pops of color and just all the, the, the really cool geometry, the repetition of lines, things like that, that I think, um, you know, as, as a painter, it's rewarding because it's, it's very uh, uh, engaging to the eye. And then, you know, hopefully the viewer um, can kind of get lost in some of the the details, you know, how it's made up and sort of appreciate this home versus, you know, the Cracker Jack home that live, that's, you know, right down the street from them. Right. I love that you have a lot of these classic cars in your paintings. I think you've really captured that part of this lifestyle. And I know a lot of people who are Eichler owners didn't know that they would become such car classic car enthusiasts but it just sort of happens as you're living in these houses you kind of absorb that time yeah I, I, I love well, that yeah I, I hear that a lot you know it's sort of that total lifestyle you know once once they get the house that's of the period then the furniture comes the <laughs> cocktails come after that and then of course the classic car yeah you find yourself with tiki torches and yeah. You know, all of these things. So I have become a huge collector of everything vintage, everything mid-century modern, even the clothing. As you can see, I'm wearing my, I always wear a mid-century modern uh, shirt for these podcasts. It's so fun. Exactly. And one of my favorite paintings that you have is of Taliath and West. I know we will get to that eventually, but um, I love how you're capturing, see there they are, the cars, we've got the flamingos, mm -hmm. but you went to, and you went to Talies and West, and you were, you take the photographs yourself, right, for the paintings. Yeah, so my working process is, um, you know, I, I work entirely from my own photos. I, I feel like it's, there it is. Oh. <laughs> you can't really know your subject matter if, if there's that kind of cold distance of just seeing it, uh, you know, someone else's photo, it's like to, to actually visit the, the location to see how the atmosphere is around it, the lighting, how the lighting changes it. Um, you know, you really feel that presence and I, and I feel like it informs my paintings and maybe my paintings are better for it. So, um, yeah, so, so my process, I, I get to actually visit these places. So that's sort of, reward enough and then I, I get to spend time painting them which is icing on the cake that's amazing yeah you've been to a lot of places you know you have Lautner homes here you showcased I think you have the stall house is that correct did I see uh, that somewhere you know what no I didn't do why well, I've been to the stall house and I've been always kind of yeah. contemplating the right painting but I haven't sort of landed on the right you know the right scene yet mm. 
Well, I think that might be next on, on your list. We'll all have requests. I'm yeah. sure if we start <laughs> requesting these <laughs> that you can you can do that and bring that to life for us to have in our homes. Perfect. So I was going to ask you, I know you've been in galleries, you've been shown all over the world. When did that start for you? And what was that process like? Yeah, it was, it was funny because... I I went to uh, I went to school. I studied at UC Santa Barbara, and I studied fine art, like painting and everything. But um, my interest sort of took me into design. Uh, I started getting into set design for theater, and like I said, I, I took like an architecture class. Um, and so I think the idea was when I graduated uh, to actually get into the film industry, which I kind of grew up around, and do art but as it pertains to film so set designs you know that kind of thing right but I did some uh internships and I dabbled in film here and there and uh, it turns out it wasn't really a good fit for me and so I was I was a bit disheartened but I realized you know the one thing I could still do was paint you know I, I didn't I didn't need an internship for that I didn't need to join a, a film crew I could just do that in my garage so uh, so I made it a point to to paint uh, just about every day after my my regular job, and <laughs> uh, eventually I caught wind of group shows where you could uh, kind of enter like a sub submission and you know get chosen for a group show. And so I was able to uh, get picked up at this uh, this really good gallery in LA. It's called uh, it's called the La Luz de Jesus Gallery, and what was cool was it was a gallery that was showing a lot of artists that actually uh, also worked in the film industry or animation. It wasn't very stuffy. It wasn't kind of what you would normally think of, you know, high galleries or whatever. It was just sort of the everyman's gallery with just the most incredible artists showing there. So I was able to get picked up in some group shows there and the work sold. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. It was, you know, enter this show or get picked up by this gallery and I think because my work I don't know touched a nerve or what have you um yes. it would sell and then I'd get picked up for more shows so you know it's just just a matter of um trying and taking chances and uh you never know what can happen that's right well I think through our community too I've always had people send me your art or an image online and I know social media is so annoying for a lot of us, but <laughs> I think it can be very good for artists to show their work and to have it circulate. Have you found that to be? Yeah, true? absolutely. Yeah, it's it's sort of, you know, the double-edged sword. We we hate it, <laughs> but also we live by it. I mean, you know, people in my industry, artists, um, it really is all about getting the work out there because, you know, who's going to buy a painting that's locked in your garage and never sees the light of day right right right, right. So we, we have this incredible opportunity nowadays where you can you can get your work and put it out there and share it with people and have it appreciated which is great um, I guess the downside is that because of that there's so much competition and you know everyone's bombarded with imagery left and right um, yes but but I guess the, the good thing about um, you know, the traditional arts, you know, sculpture and painting and drawing and that kind of stuff is that it's handmade, it's very tactile, it's something you can hold, and it it does get sort of set apart from just digital imagery that you see yes. everywhere, you know, you're bombarded with. So yeah. I think maybe it even ups the value of something that's actually like handmade by a person. Right, right. Well, we want to be bombarded with things like your art. So I think that's helpful out there in the social media world. I wanted to point out your still life um, paintings as well. So you have some with the pool, just just looking at these images of Palm Springs and the pool. Um, I'm immediately just, you know, in this trance like state. There we go. That is so wonderful to walk into a house and as we we always need staging we always need great imagery so putting one of these in a listing is sure to make people happy as they walk in the door which is what we try to do and and i yeah. love how you captured this this vibe thanks yeah i mean especially like if 
if you're showing a mid-century home and you see the lifestyle enca encapsulated in artwork, then, yes. you know, it really hits you like, oh, I, I, this could be my home. This is, this is the life I could be living. Yeah. And this one in particular does not look like a painting, Danny. It does not look like a painting. This looks like a photograph. I was so impressed. And I wanted to ask you these colors and the shading of this in the pool. How did you do this? What what is that secret? It was, you know, it was hours capturing every little palm frond and all the little details. No, it's it's funny. I think uh the you know, the more you work with a subject matter, the more you kind of you understand it and you almost develop like a shorthand on, on how to capture it and things like that. So I've been painting um, pink inner tubes and swimming pools for years yeah. now. And it's something that I, you know, I feel I've gotten to kind of know pretty well. Uh, you know, the inner tubes are, are great because it's a, it's a, it's a solid mass, but it's also translucent and the way that the light hits it and reflects off of it, but also goes through it and hits the pool and mm. it, past colors and, and everything so um you know it, it's it's a matter of sort of laying out the painting uh i usually do like one i, I draw it out and then i do a, one layer of paint and kind of step back and see okay is this is this bright enough is this dark enough uh should this be more mm -hmm. colorful should this be duller and having that initial layer of paint on that really allows me to kind of analyze you know what what's going right and what's going wrong and what do I do from there so then I usually do at least a second layer of paint and maybe even a third here and there you know touching stuff up and uh, and I think when you build up those layers you're able to get kind of the, the right balance and I think also um, you know with, with oil paints I use oil on canvas mm -hmm. oil on panel oil paints are great because they can be kind of thin and when you build up the layers, it allows kind of um, under uh, colors and under light to sort of shine through. It's it's uh, just crazy kind of, I don't know, um, physics and chemistry and all this stuff working that makes the eye just drawn to it. Yeah, well, it's working very well, I will say. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about your painting of the Chemosphere. Um yeah. And I wanted to know about that experience, just being at that house and photographing it. What is that like? I know it's very difficult to get to the view that you had yeah. of the house. All right. So between me and you and the audience, uh, <laughs> I, I had the pleasure of uh, visiting the house one day um, via the owner, uh, Benedict Cashin, who owns you know, Cashin Books. He's a wonderful gentleman. Uh, very kind, and it was also with um, what's his name, Malin. Uh, I believe Leonard Malin, who is the um, original owner, and uh, actually worked on the the Chemosphere House. So Leonard Malin and his family moved in there. You can only imagine raising a family on this uh, this this crazy UFO looking building that's perched off a steep cliff, mm. but. Uh, and we all survived. <laughs> the kids didn't roll down the hill or anything like that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I was able to, to gain access. So uh, my wife owns the Lautner Compound, which is a, a beautiful fourplex designed by John Lautner in the Coachella Valley. And through this Lautner network, you know, they're all kind of connected, all the, the owners and everything. So yes. uh, we we were able to uh, to get the invite and go there. And um, it was just it was such a spectacular. Uh, experience because it's one of those buildings like you know the Empire State Building or you know Statue of Liberty or something that you've seen repeatedly in in movies and in print and film and everything like the Chemosphere was used in multiple movies I think even in uh, the Simpsons they did a, a version of the Chemosphere mm. and um, you know to stand in front of this architecture that you've seen and heard about has all this mythology is is just incredible um, Amazing. And, yeah and then just from a technical standpoint the way it's sort of perched off of this this hillside um all the the, the building acumen and engineering that had to go into this thing and you know here it is 50 60 70 years later still standing perfect shape 
uh, is is just a marvel, you know. And and there's a lot of mid-century homes like that that were just engineered, you know, they're cantilevered off cliffs. Um, Lautner did a lot of that kind of stuff. Frank Lloyd Wright did. And the fact that a lot of it's still standing um, is just like it's incredible. And this is all before computer-aided drafting. It's all you know done by hand and, and just blood, sweat, and tears. Um, so, so you know, stuff like that just made me marvel over this this building even more. And then my challenge was like, okay, uh, it's an incredible building. How do you capture it? Right. So, right, that's amazing. And I think you you've captured that, and you've you know had such a great portfolio of these houses. So you've sort of kept that in time. You've captured that in time, which is beautiful for us. Thanks. Yeah. You know, my, my interests in modernism have sort of broadened, you know, it started, started with the tract homes and Eichler's and uh, the Alexander homes throughout the Coachella Valley. And um, I, I always felt like I needed to challenge myself. And so then I would move on to more specialized buildings, you know, like the Chemisphere, it's a, it's a one-off, you know, or I started getting into um, kind of the bigger city modernism, how architects approached, you know, municipal buildings or apartments and things like that. Um, while, you know, while it's different, it also has all these common threads with like residential homes. So <clears throat> I've always wanted to kind of tackle all of modernism. Yeah, well, you have definitely done that. I was going to ask you, is you're showing, you're having, obviously, you're showing in different galleries all the time. What is next or what can people go to that's next for you? Well, that's a great question, because speaking of, you know, doing different things, my next show is in New York. And uh, for the New York show, I, I didn't want to just focus on, uh, you know, the buildings and the, the city modernism again. Uh, so I did, started doing some research and realized that Frank Lloyd Wright developed um, a whole neighborhood uh, just north of New York called uh, Usonia. And mm -hmm. it was him and sort of his his uh, associate architects who would do stuff sort of in the Frank Lloyd Wright style. And it's, I don't know, it's like 30 or 40 of these magnificent homes all situated within the, the beautiful uh, forest up there. So it's it's modernism, but it's also a completely different um, aesthetic. You know, it's it's trees, it's vertical versus, you know, kind of the hills and the desert that I, I normally paint. So it's going to be really exciting working on the show. That's so awesome. And I think for those of you that are watching and listening online, uh, please check out Danny's website at dannyhellerart.com. My last question for you is, for everyone that has purchased your art and they have them in their homes and they share it online, what do you hope to communicate to people through your art? Uh, optimism. It's it's really about how how special these homes are, how optimistic and uplifting they are. And I think that was sort of the the whole point of them, uh, you know, in the beginning, like they were developed mostly around World War II, post-war, and the idea of connecting with the nature around you via, you know, floor to ceiling glass and incorporating outside elements inside, you know, it was all about sort of uplifting the spirit. It was about uh, leisure lifestyle. It was about just kind of that optimism and that forward momentum and, uh, I think we could benefit from that nowadays. Yes, we can. Right now, especially, I think this is so needed for everyone. And thank yeah. you for producing such optimism and for producing such beautiful, happy artwork that we can all share. Thank so. you. I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time to look at my work, take an interest in it. I, I really do appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we'll see everyone next time on the next episode. Thanks again, Danny. Thank you.